first of all, the term gene doesn't have a very clear definition. There isn't truly a, a single accepted definition for a term that's used so widely. I think that's, that's a fascinating. It's idea. crazy, right? That's just yeah. like weird. Yeah. Cause everybody throws the word around as if they know what it means. And right. yet, molecular biologists are not at all clear on that. There are coding regions and maybe we use that at least as one working definition of a gene. But the mRNA in between may be spliced differently depending on circumstance. So right. the same gene may have a different final expression. Absolutely. That's right. It turns mm. out it's extremely common that a single segment of DNA can give rise to multiple different kinds of outcomes. Right. Dr. Moore, Dr. David Moore, I found you through a reference to your book, The Dependent Gene, and some articles online, and you were kind enough to agree to come teach me maybe more pseudo in person, I guess. I wonder if you could just maybe tell the audience a little bit about your background, and then we can jump into some more interesting topics here. Sure. I became interested in psychology when I was an undergraduate. And through my contacts at my university, I wound up working in a, a newborn infant lab. And at that point, I'd never seen a newborn baby before because I was 17 years old and just hadn't happened. And when I finally did, I thought, well, how can anyone ever understand anything going on in, in these babies' minds? The people I was working with had figured out ways to, in that case, get a sense of how long newborn babies memories last and I thought this was the coolest thing I'd ever seen so I went to graduate school to study infant perception and cognition got my PhD from Harvard and then after a one-year postdoc in New York City came out here to Southern California where I've been working as a professor ever since I run the Claremont Infant Study Center where we collect empirical data on babies in particular we've been interested in things like how babies respond to the baby talk tone of voice that parents use when they talk. We've also been looking at a phenomenon called mental rotation, which is the ability to imagine what an object would look like if it was rotated in space. Turns out some babies mm -hmm. can do that. But theoretically, I became interested in what happens before babies are born, because as an undergraduate, I was naive enough to think that experiences don't begin until birth. And I thought that studying a baby mm. would be a good way to get at a nature-nurture kind of question. Turns out it's not a great way to get at a nature-nurture kind of question because <laughs> babies have all kinds of experiences while they're in utero. And that led me to study fetal development and then embryonic development. And ultimately, I started looking at genomes and how they function. And I was surprised at what I discovered there. Yeah, and we'll get into that. I think I, I had told you already I wanted to start with a quote from the end of, of your first book, The, De the Dependent Gene. Wanton uh, was asked in 1991, why then do so many powerful, famous, successful, and extremely intelligent scientists want to sequence the human genome? The answer is in part that they are so completely devoted to the ideology of simple unitary causes that they believe in the efficacy of the research and do not ask themselves more complicated questions. But in part, the answer has to do with economic and status rewards awaiting those who take part in the project. Some farsighted biologists have cautioned against the terrible public disillusionment that will follow. The public will discover that despite the inflated claims of molecular biologists, people are still dying of cancer, of heart disease, of stroke, that institutions are still filled with schizophrenics and manic depressives, and that the war against drugs has not been won. And that was in 1991, shortly at, or while the Human Genome Sequencing Project first was going on, I believe. And I remember when that was completed, how the claim, well, in 10 years, we will have solutions to so many problems. And of course, 10 years came and went. And, and at, that, at that time, they said, well, 10 more years. <laughs> and, and 10 years has again come and gone. I love the idea that the issue here is an ideological one, that the simple linear explanation just isn't right. And, and we're not going to get where the media says we will. Yeah. Lewontin actually wrote a book called Biology as Ideology, 
And it's really all, all about how science can be ideologically driven and not necessarily follow the empirical observations. So uh, the upshot is I think people have been somewhat disappointed. It's not the case that no progress has been made. We've certainly learned more about what the genome is doing, but as we've learned more about what the genome is doing, it's more and more confirmed what Luantin was saying and then what I said eight years later, which is that in order to really understand where our characteristics are coming from, you need to understand more about how the genome is operating. So the code by itself is not enough. You need to know what other molecules it's interacting with and how and why and when. Yeah. And I think cutting to the, the heart of some of these things throughout this book, you, you point out that we are told in elementary school, perhaps, these, these simple stories about eye color or hair color. And so many of us carry forward that understanding and sort of just tack on any new information we have on top of that pre-existing linear sort of uh, simple belief without questioning the deeper underpinnings. And so maybe you can give us an idea of, of how, you know, eye color or hair color may not be fully genetic. Because that, that struck me in, your, in reading your book that, that you know, copper, copper levels in the cell and melanin had a, had a role to play and it was environmental to a degree. Yeah, I think I told an anecdote in my story about when I was younger and traveling in India and I encountered some kids who looked malnourished and their hair was not the black color that most of the other people in the, that community had. Instead, it was more of a kind of rusty color. And mm. I discovered much later on that that was a function of the malnutrition that was going on, not enough copper in the diet. So at the time, I didn't understand that that was just a, a good example of how it is that an environmental factor can affect a characteristic that would be a really general kind of understanding. The truth is all of our characteristics are open to environmental influence, but we often don't see that because our environments are very constant in some cases. So mm -hmm. here in the United States, it's pretty rare for people not to get enough copper in their diet. And so to our eyes, it seems like the environment is not making any difference. But if you understand how the characteristic develops, it turns out that the environment always makes a difference. Um, <laughs> when you talk about eye color, my favorite example is David Bowie, the musician. Mm -hmm. um, he got in a fight when he was young and got punched in the eye. The upshot is he then had different colored eyes for the rest of his life. After after a trauma basically col changed the eye color. Yeah. Um, so, subsequent to our previous discussion, you had mentioned that, and and it I didn't the, it didn't make the connection at the time, but I actually had eye surgery for lens implantation to get my vision corrected. So mm -hmm. there's a lens behind my pupil. One of the common side effects is actually a lightening of eye color. So Absolutely. they, they actually say that among the, among the known side effects of the procedure is to have a lightening of eye color. So environment, again, having, having a role on something we consider to be genetic. And of course, things like height and nutrition, I think are, are known in some way, but not thought about it. It was an interesting blindness almost to everyone knows that, oh, if you're malnourished, then you won't develop as much height, people in third world countries often don't reach, you know, within within a generation of moving to the U.S., the kill, the children go much taller. And yet it doesn't make us question our, our elementary school understanding of how of how genetics works. Right. And I think that I think Luantin had it right. It's because people generally like simple, straightforward, easy to comprehend narratives. And the idea that mm. genes cause traits is really appealing to us in some way. The way the traits actually develop is extremely complicated and people often don't want to hear that. Yes. No, I, I, I think something I run into quite often, I was, I was lucky enough to come across a, a book of James Glick's Chaos on, on Chaos Theory when I was relatively young and complexity theory, that sort of thing. And then Wolfram's commentary on irreducibility in, in computation. And some of those ideas just made me think that biological systems work, you know, it, it, the rules don't have to be complicated for you to be completely unable to predict major effects with, because the environment or the, the particular inputs can be 
infinitely variable. You, you even mentioned, I think, at one point, the idea of developmental noise. I yeah. loved that term. Yeah, I know some scientists who really don't like that term because it, it sort of says okay. it's it, there's a randomness and you know we're never going to know. But mm. I included it in my book because I like it because I do think there are some unpredictable aspects of environment. And that particular notion of developmental noise is best illustrated by a fruit fly growing up in a single environment that has a different right side of its body than the left side of its body. And how is that mm. possible when its genome on the right side of its body and the left side of its body is identical? And it's in a very, very controlled environment. And the answer is that development is a complex process. And as we are developing, you know, the right side of your body cannot be in the exact same position as the left side of your body, <laughs> right? Because one's here and one's yeah, here. Correct. And to the extent that they're not actually ever going to experience identical environments, there are going to be differences. So in the next section, Dr. Moore and I discuss heritability using several of his examples, but we jumped into a rather counterintuitive topic without discussing the basic definitions. Heritability is often defined as the degree to which genetic variation explains variations in traits. That language gives the incorrect impression that heritability reflects the degree to which genes cause traits. That's a natural way of understanding the definition, but it's completely wrong. Imagine a situation in which you grow a bunch of seeds in a lab. The seeds have normal genetic diversity for the species, and the lab provides uniform, consistent light, soil, water, etc. In this case, heritability of height, which is calculated as the ratio of genetic variation to trait variation, would be 100%. That is, all of the variation in height would be explained by, quote-unquote, genetic differences. By contrast, if you took one of those seeds and made a bunch of identical genetic clones and grew each seed in a different pot of soil with different water or light, then all of the variation in height would be due to environment, so the heritability would be 0%. So for the same species, heritability of height can fluctuate from 0% to 100% depending on the context of the experiment. Thus, heritability estimates are essentially confined only to the study in which they are done and cannot be generalized. Similarly, in other examples, you might not think of hairstyle as being a heritable trait, but of course, there are genetic factors such as curliness or gender that will influence hairstyles in conjunction with culture. You might think that for chickens, the absence of teeth is a genetic factor, but chick embryos exposed to the influence of mouse embryo tissue can grow teeth. Theorists have considered that dinosaurs had teeth, and the absence of teeth in birds may have been due to the silencing of those genes in development during the evolution of birds. But there was no change in the genes themselves, only in the developmental expression. The examples are numerous. Cloned cows can have different coloration and different temperament, for instance. Or there's the curious case of identical conjoined twins, Chang and Eng, who shared all of their DNA and essentially all of their life experiences, and yet had markedly different personalities. Chang was melancholy and driven to drink, while Eng was cheerful and easygoing. In each case, the main point is that the notion of heritability, which is a statistical measure of the correlation between genetic variation and trait variation in a particular population, at a particular time, in a particular context, has absolutely nothing to do with our intuitive, subjective notion of inheritability, which we apply to the notion of how likely it is for a trait to pass from parents to offspring, but is incalculable because traits always involve an interaction between genes and the environment. All right, back to the conversation. So I was about to bridge into the notion of heritability. I really appreciated a lot of the commentary you made on how that is not in the, the word itself seems to imply an interpretation that's not correct. Yeah, it seems to be about inheritability, the likelihood that you're going to inherit a characteristic, but that's not actually what it is at all. I myself didn't realize that that was more related to the correlative nature of a finding and a gene. I appreciated a lot of your examples, actually. The 
high inheritability of having an earring in 1950 mm-hmm. in that there was a strong genetic correlation back then. And then the genetic correlation weakened over time. Right. Yeah, that's an example from Ned Block, a philosopher who really opened my eyes to the interpretational difficulties associated with heritability. Another example I like, since you mentioned height earlier, is how dramatically heritability is influenced by the population that's being studied. So here in the United States, where um, there isn't that much variability in people's nutritional intake, heritability of height is fairly high because most of what accounts for the differences among us is our genetic factors. But if you look at a population like in North Korea, where some people have plenty of food and some people have very little food, you find that the heritability is much lower. And that makes it obvious that the characteristic itself is not something that ought to be thought of as heritable or not heritable. Instead, what heritability is, is a measure of a population. So in the same way that you could ask what the average weight of people is in Boston and compare that to the average weight of people in San Francisco, you get two different numbers, but it doesn't tell you something about weight. It tells you something about those populations. And it's the same thing with heritability. The heritability of height tells you something about the people who are being measured, not about height itself. That's a great clarification. I think the particular examples, height you mentioned, um, I think heritability of number of fingers struck me that you're commenting on the variance in a population. And so you would assume that the heritability was actually quite low in some sense because the environment seemed to have create most of the effects in the variation in fingers and toes. Right. And the genetic contributions would, would be negligible or some of the other great examples. Um, snowfall. Oh, that one. That was a great one. Snowfall at the North Pole versus the South Pole varies as a function of humidity, whereas snowfall at the North Pole versus Costa Rica is not a function of humidity, it's a function of temperature, because both are causal inputs. But when you're comparing populations, the variance may seem to only vary on on one of those variables. Yeah, if the other variable is being held constant, you won't know that it's an important variable. If it's always cold enough in a particular place to snow, then temperature doesn't seem like it's important because the variation in whether or not there's snow is a function of humidity. Uh, yeah, but if you hold humidity constant and let temperature vary, then temperature looks like it's the important factor. So, there, you know, just in case people aren't necessarily following the metaphor, the idea here is yeah. that genes or and environments are both always important in an outcome. We just can't see the importance sometimes because certain factors are being held constant. In particular, I think with the twin studies, I mean, you pointed out how similar some of those environments were, and then claims were made that that the genes created the similarity, and yet the environments were also remarkably similar. Right. Yeah, in most of those studies where twins were adopted into different environments, they're a little different, but there are a lot of ways in which they're not different. Um, Typically, Identical twins are not adopted away into different countries that are very far from each other. They're typically adopted into different communities in the country where the babies were born. And, you know, within any country, there's going to be a lot of similarity across environments. And I I think it's worth pointing out that that's true in general, not just for twin studies. There are certain characteristics of human developmental environments that are always constant. So things like gravity and sunlight and the presence of adult human, some forms of nutrition, these things characterize all human developmental environments. And so it's easy for us to um, overlook how important those things are because they're not accounting for any of the variation that we see in people. But just because they're not accounting for variation doesn't mean that they're not super important. 
I think that's well said. I think the moving on to a slightly different topic, I think one of the things that struck me is you talked about the history of some of these genetic ideas. The one that struck me most, I think, was you called the talked about the preformationists, where the idea was that there was a preformed female inside each egg that just got bigger. It had everything. It just somehow got bigger. Right. Right. Or potentially a tiny little male, right? Yep. She would, because she could have a son also. So yeah, there's just some tiny little person preformed inside the egg. Yeah. I think the thing that struck me about that idea was the argument at the time that we just needed better microscopes. Mm -hmm. And I see a direct, to me, a, a correlation with our current ideology that genetics further investigation, more computational power. We need more AI scanning to find the right correlations. And it just seems like a, a continuation of that. We just need more, but we're not going to give up our, our framework that Genetics is the blueprint, and we are just the house built on that blueprint. And that ideology, uh, whenever it runs into trouble, people just say, well, we need more computing power. Right. And that's not right, because the framework's not right. And so more computing power isn't going to solve the problem. Having said that, I would say that it turned out that uh, 400 years ago, they were kind of right. It was ultimately the development of better microscopes that helped resolve the preformation mm. debate. Once we could, <laughs> you know, see better, we could see, hey, wait a minute, there's a time early in development when there is no beating heart present. And then there's a time later in development when there is a beating heart present. And so the heart must not have been there preformed beforehand, but instead emerged as a function of development. Well, so maybe analogously, we'll reach a point of computing power at which we say that we, we can discover some final disconfirmation that may convince the general public as readily as they've been convinced that there's not a little homunculus inside the ovaries. Right. Galton, I, I think, I think, I couldn't quite tell if this was his quote or you were just quoting in relation to him, but what nature does blindly, slowly, and ruthlessly, man may do providentially, quickly, and kindly. Um, that is a Galton I, quote. Okay. I, I think that that's the dream, right? I think that's the intention or one of the intentions, at least behind a lot of these desires to simplify is that if genetics is just a code and we can understand that code. Then we can, we don't have to wait for the painful process of evolution. We can ac accelerate that somehow. We can improve things with our own sort of inputs, whether that's aging or intelligence or any of those things. Yeah, that's the idea. The only problem is that in Galton's case, that led to eugenics, which is pretty much widely recognized as um, not a good development in the history of ideas. <laughs> and, um, so maybe it should not be the idea the problem is you know good-hearted well-meaning people do want to try to make the world better for other people and if it is possible to intervene in the developmental process and thereby give someone the kind of life that um most people would value as opposed to one that most people see as very challenged many of us feel like we want to do that um mm. certainly there are communities of people with so-called disabilities who would argue that their disabilities are very much a part of who they are and they would not trade those they appreciate sure. the challenges that come with their disabilities and certainly i think people should be given the opportunity to make decisions for themselves but in the case of babies they can't make the decisions themselves and so right they have to trust their parents and if their parents think that there's a particular intervention that might make for a better life for that child usually we would consider that a good thing mm -hmm. and i think if you can improve a child's life with some sort of genetic manipulation that's great it's just rarely been the case that people have been able to do that 
because genes are not so easily manipulated. Uh, they're more easily manipulated now since we, we have tools like CRISPR, but the manipulations have to happen very early because once a fertilized egg starts dividing, pretty soon you got a lot of genome in there and changing all of those genes is possible. And, well, and I think that that gets into it. At least in your second book, I think I was struck by your commentary in an epigenetic sense that, you know, that even, first of all, that the term gene doesn't have a very clear definition. There isn't truly a, a single accepted definition for a term that's used so widely. I think that's, that's a fascinating, uh, it's idea. crazy, right? That's just yeah. like weird. Yeah. Cause everybody throws the word around as if they know what it means. And right. yet, molecular biologists are not at all clear on that. I think that's a deeply fascinating and, and reflective, right? Of the idea that something that we think we understand so well may in fact be something that we're very vague on. We have this idea that, okay, there are coding regions and maybe we use that at least as one working definition of a gene. But I think between the two books, you really brilliantly pointed out a couple of obvious issues is that one gene may code for a protein but the mRNA in between may be spliced differently depending on circumstance. So right. the same gene may have a different final phenotypic expression based on different mRNA splicing. Is that, have I understood that correctly? Absolutely. That's right. And when I first wrote my first book in the late 90s, Alternative splicing was recognized as a phenomenon, but no one had any idea yet how incredibly widespread it is. But it turns mm. out it's extremely common that a single segment of DNA can give rise to multiple different kinds of outcomes depending on where that DNA is located. So that's, first of all, a phenomenal oversight in the popular. We were taught that as a linear process. Gene. Right codes for MRA, maybe there's some pl splicing, the, you know, introns are cut out and it's re-spliced together and then a protein is formed, but it's presented in a line. It's right. not presented as, well, then there's a branching set of possibilities depending on environment. Yeah. Going that a step further in your second book, the regulation sites for genes that can be methylated and turned on and off to on or off. Uh, or with histones acetylated, I think the that one gene may have multiple regulation sites. So to to activate that stretch of DNA, there may be multiple inputs from areas of the genome that are even on separate chromosomes. Yeah, uh, and then each tr regulation site may turn on or off multiple different genes, and so. Right the final transcription, even to mRNA, the rate of that transcription or how often it happens has multiple inputs on the regulation level and then vice versa, the regulators control multiple things. Yeah. So there are some theorists who have argued that DNA and the whole system that's involved in translating it, it might better be thought of as operating kind of like the way neurons operate on the grounds mm -hmm. that neurons are taking multiple inputs and integrating them to come up with some sort of final uh, quote-unquote decision about whether or not to fire an action potential. And I definitely think it's rare for people to think of DNA as operating that way, but it appears to. I think that speaks to what we were talking about earlier is the complex kind of nearly irreducible or potentially mathematically, theoretically irreducible idea that it, we may not be able to get a granular control over this system. I think that I think that's maybe the dream is that we can understand the system so well that we can make specific targeted changes and get specific predictable results in phenotype. And I think this is just breaking down that that's not going to be possible. Um, I think in some cases it might be possible, but I think those are going to be few and far between. Most things are more complicated than that. Now, I'm a pragmatist, and I want to be able to help people in whatever way is possible. And it's entirely possible that our fragmented understanding will be enough to make a positive difference in people's lives. Mm -hmm. And Fair so, enough. you know, I do think there's value in continuing to study the genome and, and how it's working.
but I think we'd all be served by taking a step back and taking a broader view and recognizing that if we look at more than just the DNA code, well, we're probably going to get farther. I think that's well said. And I also think throughout both books, I think there was this theme that, hey, if we really accept that development, environment, affect gene expression, and this is an interdependent, cross-talking kind of system, well, just focusing all of our efforts on one half of that puzzle may not be in everyone's best interest. And there may be, I don't know if you get this sense, but I almost feel like there may be low-hanging fruit on the other side that we ideologically have not really taken the time to look at. Yeah. An example of that is PKU, stands for phenylketonuria, mm-hmm. is a condition that's typically thought of in the medical community. Can correct me if I'm wrong, but nope, absolutely. People, people tend to think of it as a genetic disorder. And it's because people who have PKU don't have a segment of DNA that most of the rest of us do that leads to the production of a protein that breaks down a substance called phenylalanine. And so if you're in that condition, your the phenylalanine builds up in your body, you ultimately get rid of it through your urine, which is why it's called phenylketonuria. And the urine, you can see that there's a, there's a problem there. And typically people, children who have this condition, wind up with mental retardation. But once it was discovered how it is that the mental retardation comes about, it was clear that the problem is the phenylalanine, not necessarily the genetic defect. And so if you just restrict phenylalanine and the baby's diet, they can grow up to have a perfectly normal IQ. So that's an example of something that looks like a genetic disorder, but there's a simple environmental fix, namely restrict their diet in in some small way. Absolutely. I also really loved in the, just preceding that in, in the book, the example of the HFE gene for hemochromatosis. So hemochromatosis is a condition where you build up iron, iron gets deposited in various body tissues and causes various disease. But the idea that you could have a homozygote for the gene mutation, meaning they both copies of their gene are abnormal or, or you know, diseased, if you want to call it that, and yet they don't have disease. Many of them do not have disease. The range of expression goes from zero to full problem. So some of them may have both copies and be abnormal and yet not show any of the phenotypic findings. That brought me to another analogy that you made I I quite liked was the domino analogy, that you can set up 26 dominoes in a row from A to Z, And if you tip over the A, then the Z falls, and we say that A causes Z. And yet that's an unusual framing on some level, even though it seems intuitive, because I could have knocked over J and still caused Z to fall. So is J the cause? Or I could have turned J sideways or removed it, and then Z would not have fallen. What that reminded me most of was the the popular media studies of, well, we have found the gene for obesity or whatever. And the study fundamentally was, hey, we tipped over this gene or we removed this gene from a mouse or whatever it was, and Z didn't fall or did fall or whatever it is, and ignores the cascade. Right. And, you know, if the goal is to produce an outcome and you can do it by tweaking a particular gene, that's great. But I think it's worth recognizing that there are other potential ways to produce an outcome too. And some of those may be less expensive or easier to implement. And so ultimately, I think this perspective is a more optimistic perspective because it recognizes that there are multiple possible ways in which you can produce an outcome. It's interesting you frame that as optimistic. I guess maybe I frame that a bit more pessimistically, and at least in the short term. One of the things I struggle with in my patients is many of them in tech. We're in Austin, Texas, and so there's a desire for this sort of tech-based control over their health or longevity. And so I get a lot of articles on how, well, we found the gene for, you know, my patients love sending me articles. And I love that they communicate with me, but Part of the reason I wanted to talk to you is to hopefully flesh out some more nuanced understandings of of these media articles where 
hey, the answer may be as boring as diet and exercise. Mm-hmm. And that there may be a genetic reason or an epigenetic reason why those things result in certain gene expressions or so on and so forth. And we can get into the science of that. But that, in fact, may be the easier way of controlling your longevity. Right. I think we have more evidence about the value of good diet and exercise than we do about pretty much any other intervention. Sure. Boring though it may be, I'm with you on this. I think those are often probably the first weapons we should go to in our arsenal as we try to keep ourselves healthy. Yeah, I have to mention my father here because and I'm sure he will end up watching this. So I will tease him a bit that that he very much culturally is in the paradigm of, you know, my father or my grandfather lived this way or lived to 90 with no problems. So that idea of uh, genetic versus environment, the flaw that I think your book pointed out in my own counter argument is I I would make counter arguments like, well, I think 95% of your health outcomes are from environment or development. And you pointed out that the entire concept of trying to put percentages on these things is flawed. The metaphor that I like to use to try to convey that idea is based on a machine that will be disappearing from the earth, hopefully, over the next hundred years, and that would be the internal combustion engine in an automobile. A lot of people are driving electric cars now, and people don't necessarily understand the gasoline engines that used to be in cars. But the way they work is gasoline goes into a chamber and it needs to be ignited. And what ignites it is a spark that comes out of a thing called a spark plug. And people generally know that gasoline is important to have in a vehicle or it's not going to go. Some people might know that it's important to have spark plugs because if you can't get the spark, your car is not going to go. So if you start asking questions like, which is more important, the spark plug or the gasoline? That's just the wrong question because neither one is more important than the other. Because if you don't have either one, the thing's not going to go. They're both completely critical. And it's the same with genes and environments. I think that the, as you, it just goes, loops right back to where we talked about heritability and the idea that things are 90% heritable or 70% heritable. It occurs to me, I wanted to dive, a, make, not maybe deeper, but a, a slightly a slant of that. Is, my perception of some of the most of the genetics or these kinds of gene articles that I read is that they are fundamentally correlative in that they say, well, we see these people with this phenotype and we've analyzed their entire genomes and these have this in common, whereas the population does not. Right. Is, that, is that a fair assessment of how those studies are done? Definitely. There are some studies that are more experimental, but they can only be done with various animal species. And so pretty much any study of human genetics and how they affect outcomes are not getting at causal processes. They're all correlative. Yeah. And I think that you eloquently explain that if you see two things, A could cause B, If you find a correlation, A could cause B, B could cause A. And again, I think most people have the framework of genetics as a one-way blueprint. The information flows out from the genome only, right? not the idea that the environment comes in and turns genes on and off, chooses what to express, or even the same gene being expressed can result in different proteins with different mRNA splicing. So multiple levels on which the flow could be going the other way. Yeah. And third, the one that's always forgotten, I think, is that C, unknown to us, could be causing A and B. Right. I see that a lot. Yeah. There's this old analogy of a culture in which, for some horrible reason, they decide that they don't like redheaded children, and so they beat those kids over the head. Well, you know, as a result of that, those kids wind up with all kinds of negative outcomes, including lower than average intelligence. Well, because hair color has a genetic component, if the only kids getting beaten over the head are the red haired kids, there's going to be a genetic element there that's going to wind up correlated with intelligence, but it has nothing to do with 
the, those genes causing that intelligence, but rather the third factor. So, and it turns out it's always possible that there's a third thing like that. Absolutely. I think in, in talking with patients, I mean, I struggle to, to communicate this quite clearly, though I, I love that example, because it hinges, the third thing, C causing both A and B, hinges on the idea that we don't know everything. And unfortunately, I think that is a difficult push where we think we know the basic building blocks, but most people aren't even aware of histones or acylation. And you mentioned several processes like the NAD methylation, where we don't, even then we don't know all the things that are going on. Right. Um, or I think you mentioned a histone code, something like that. Yeah, that's just a theoretical possibility at this point. Some theorists sure. have speculated about it, but it, there may be such a thing. If there is, we certainly don't understand it yet. But the, you know, even without going there, it's clear that there's a lot that we still don't understand. And you know, I get this. Nobody likes to go to the doctor and have the doctor say, "Hmm, I have no idea," right? Mm -hmm. um, the doctors have good reasons to want to sound confident about what we know. And that often does serve the patient because the patient likes to have confidence in their doctor. And if the doctor isn't confident in themselves, that's, that's a problem. But the upshot is that we convey to the general public that we know more than we do. And in fact, there's a lot sure. that's still kind of mysterious. I think that speaks maybe a bit emotionally to my interaction with some of my patients in that I try very hard and I've got the fortune to be a concierge doctor. So I have an hour per patient. I have plenty of time to talk, email me. All the, nonetheless, I spend that time often communicating fundamentally. I don't know. Right. <laughs> you know, it's a fancy version of I don't know. Right. Here, here's some of the factors, probabilities, X, Y, Z. Um, it's, not, it's not, I don't know because I haven't manage to learn that it's no one knows correct right doctors don't know yet scientists don't know they're you know a lot of stuff like that absolutely i think actually that's a perfect i actually and this is the point maybe i would love to try to, to hammer home is there are those categories i don't know because i haven't read up on that it's maybe not my specialty or whatever i don't know because no one knows science hasn't gotten there yet and i don't know because there may see, even theoretically or mathematically be no way to know. And I think that, with some genetic things, that may be the case. Certainly right now, that's a case where more computing power might at some point be of some value to us. But there's no doubt that at the moment, there are things that we can't know. Yeah, I think that that was Probably the main point I, wa I wanted to hammer home, and uh, I don't know if there's anything else you'd like to leave off on, but we, we had, throughout the technical difficulties, I think we, we wandered our way through most of the things that we wanted to talk about. Good. Well, I hope the splicing works. Speaking of RNA splicing, <laughs> you get to do <laughs> some editing. I don't have anything else in particular, but if you come up with other questions and want to have a follow-up, I'll be around. Awesome. I would love that. Yeah, I'm sure I will. Okay. It was a pleasure. Likewise. Thanks right. so much. Yeah.